five, four, three, two. We're back, folks. Freedom Forum 2 on this, the 14th day of the first month, year of our Lord Jesus the Christ, 2015. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together tonight. We ask that you strengthen us in our defense of the Ten Commandments, your commandments for us, just as you give us the strength the wisdom and the courage to defend against encroachment into the government's Ten Commandments, our Bill of Rights. We thank you in Jesus the Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to be politically incorrect the rest of the night. Oh, wait. Were we politically correct at all first hour? A little bit. A little bit, you think? Okay. We have a new word. Ineptocracy, a system of government where the least capable to lead are elected by the least capable of producing, and where the members of society least likely to sustain themselves or succeed are rewarded with goods and services paid for by the confiscated wealth of a diminishing number of producers. Ineptocracy. In the meantime, we have our meeting at Elise's tomorrow night at 6.30, and we'll be discussing all kind of stuff, so bring something to take notes on. And we go back, let's see if I can go back to something else here. <clears throat> the immigration problem in Europe is a serious one, and it's going to get that bad here. We mentioned the no-go zones in the first hour. There are similar areas in this country where the police will not go in to a neighborhood, etc. They're less formalized than they are in, in France, for example. But nevertheless, they exist. And this is where we're headed, is to a breakup of the country directly or indirectly, which uh, in some ways may be a good thing, the way the situation has boiled down. But in the meantime, the people fighting these folks are coming off with all kinds of interesting stuff. Walter Williams, beware race baiters and hustlers. His column last week focused on the way liberals use blacks in pursuit of their leftist agenda, plus their demeaning attitudes towards black people. Most demeaning are their double standards. It was recently reported that Representative Steve Scalise from here spoke at a 2002 gathering hosted by white supremacists when he was a Louisiana state representative. Some are calling on him to step down or for Speaker John, ba John Boehner to fire him as uh, the majority whip. There's no claim that he made any racist statements whatsoever. Hardly anyone blinks an eye at the Reverend Al Sharpton's racist statements, such as, quote, white folks was in the caves while we blacks was building empires. We built pyramids before Donald Trump ever knew what architecture was. We taught philosophy and astrology and mathematics before Socrates and them Greek homos ever got around to it, unquote. Sharpton again, quote, so if some cracker come and tell you, well, my mother and father blood go back to the Mayflower, you better hold your pocket. That ain't nothing to be proud of. That means your forefathers was crooks, unquote. Sharpton also offered, quote, if the Jews want to get it on, tell them to pin their yarmulkes back and come over to my house, unquote. Despite such racism, Obama has made Sharpton his go-to guy on matters of race. But not to worry. 
Obama himself spent 20 years listening to Reverend Jeremiah Wright's anti-Semitic and racist sermons. The news media and intellectual elite don't condemn Sharpton or Obama because they have two standards of behavior, one for whites and a lower one for blacks. The news media's narrative about the police shooting in Ferguson, Missouri is that a white cop shot and killed an unarmed black man who was holding his hands up. Their New York City narrative is that a white cop used a chokehold that killed a black man. The news media people and their liberal allies know the facts, but they need to promote the appearance of injustice to keep black people in a state of grievance. During grand jury testimony about the Ferguson incident, seven black witnesses testified that Michael Brown was charging the policeman when he was shot. The autopsies performed by three sets of forensic experts, one hired by the family, or Sharpton. Of course, the first one was from the state, was the, the uh, regular coroner's autopsy. The third one was by the feds. The feds hired uh, a pathologist to come in. Three autopsies, okay, confirmed that Officer Darren Wilson's version of the events was correct. News media narrative of Eric Garner's death in New York is that he died because of a chokehold that had stopped his breathing. He actually died later in an ambulance where his heart stopped while being taken to the hospital. Chokehold was instrumental in triggering Garner's pre-existing health problems of acute and chronic bronchial asthma, obesity, and heart disease, but he was not choked to death as claimed by the media. Both Brown and Garner would be alive today if they'd not resisted arrest. Oh. We mentioned that in the first hour, didn't we? But pointing that out would not serve the purpose of keeping blacks in a perpetual state of grievance. I'm old enough to remember the racist lynching mentality of yesteryear, regardless of the evidence. Emmett Till, a Chicago teenager visiting relatives in Money, Mississippi during the summer of 55, was accused of flirting with a white woman. Klansmen took him to a barn. The rest is history. The New York Times published the street name on which Officer Wilson lived. <coughs> Excuse me. Had the frenzied mob cut up, caught up with him, regardless of evidence, he might have suffered the same fate as Emmett Till in Mississippi. <coughs> Excuse me. Multi-ethnic societies are inherently unstable, and how we handle matters of race is contributing to that instability. <coughs> Decent Americans should see the dangers posed by America's race hustlers who are stacking up piles of combustible racial kindling ready for <coughs> <coughs> ready for a racial arsonist to set it ablaze. Walter Williams. Oh, by the way, Walter Williams is not Caucasian in case you don't know who he is. But he also happens to be professor of economics at George Mason University. And he's a guy that we could vote for. Well, <clears throat> there's other folks who have come out on this uh, issue. A couple of criticisms of uh, Representative Steve Scalise in the Baton Rouge paper for a speech to an unacceptable group in 2002. Why? Because Scalise is a conservative Republican. What about the past transgressions of a prominent liberal Democrat? Bill Ayers, who bombed the Pentagon prior to September 11, 2001, hosted a fundraiser for his friend in 1995, and they socialized and served on boards together. Ayer's friend was a 20-year member of the Church of Jeremiah Wright, the preacher who asked God to damn America. This prominent liberal Democrat was associated with former communist Frank Marshall Davis. Who's this prominent liberal Democrat? Barack Hussein Obama. But he's a prominent liberal Democrat, therefore his past associations are not relevant or even newsworthy. This is from a retired attorney in Slidell, Richard Regan. Uh, Wayne Blankenship, Jr., from Kenner. In the interest of full disclosure, he's proud to say that Steve Scalise is his representative. He goes on to say, I'm saddened that some politicians and others have chosen to try and sully his good name. It won't work. 
In a recent advocate, there were several stories about his speech in 02, as reported by a liberal blogger. It would be interesting to know just who that blogger is. I wonder if they've been holding this blog for just the right time for maximum impact on the Republican leadership in the new Congress. That's a good question, Wayne. How long has this guy known about this so-called uh, transgression by Scalise? Blankenship goes on, I have to confess I've never heard of the group he addressed about taxes, nor ever knew that at one time David Duke was associated with it. From one story, it appears that Duke had not been active in it for several years. Currently, we're much more concerned about the climate of hate that's been fomented by the likes of Reverends Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson. Of course, that reverend part needs to be in quotes because we're not sure what their <laughs> pedigree is. And even the president and the attorney general. This certainly led to the killing of the two officers in New York City. The focus on hate groups should be on Sharpton's committee and Jackson's Rainbow Coalition and others of their ilk. What members of both political parties have addressed these hate groups? Locally, what politicians were associated with the disgraced ACORN group? I hope the advocates reporters will delve into all groups on the liberal side. In the meantime, he agrees with former Senator Jay Bennett Johnson and others that Scalise does not have a racist bone in his body. And by the way, I'm still waiting for apologies from all those who have perpetuated the lies about hands up, don't shoot. Yeah. These same people have given us a lot of looting and violence around the entire country. Now those are from out of town. We have here excerpts from an article written by our own Charles McGowan, who's an ordained Christian chaplain, served in the Marine Corps. As a young man in the early 1960s, I, Mr. McGowan, had been aware of joint efforts by many groups to fan the flames of violence, civil and racial unrest, while promoting movements to restrain or handcuff local police departments. In the early 60s and 70s, there have been accounts of attacks on police by revolutionaries who previous and current battle cries of kill the pigs were used as assaults in addition to bombing incidents against buildings and vehicles. This has escalated into most recent cries against police by race baiters and spewers of hate like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton. Uh, during recent times, we also witnessed Obama and Eric Holder, Attorney General, who was held in contempt of Congress, express on national news their understanding as to the actions by a thief and a thug who was killed as a result of an attack on a police officer. Much attention was given to the criminal's family by Obama and Holder, whereas no attention or consolation was given to the officer and his family. Let us recognize the anti-police sentiment expressed by many who have been influenced by pro-communist agitators who call for death to police officers who risk their lives in order to provide protection for those who wrongfully hide behind the First Amendment and distort the true meaning of freedom of speech. Now. He goes on to call for supporting the local police in Louisiana, and to a point, he's correct. All of this still must be taken in the context of the militarization of the police that's been ongoing for quite some time with their cooperation. And we must not forget that the police used to be here to protect and serve, as many of their cars still say, to protect and serve, but it's not to protect us and serve the public, or it doesn't seem that way in many cases. So the police are to be held to a higher standard than anybody else in society, except for their political leaders and appointed leaders who as the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is expected. So let's put this in the proper perspective, okay, folks. Uh, the police are human. 
the police baiters are human. But it seems more and more that the generic attitudes about the police by certain left-wingers have become more and more politically motivated without, well, going back to the progressive mentality, without concern for the facts. But where was the uh, outrage over other incidents that have happened in the past, very recent past, where the, uh, the victims of police overreach were not Negroes, but Caucasians. Now, let's go back to the notion of free speech in Paris. This has come out quite heavily, last week especially, in the attacks on the uh, what was the name of that? Charlie mm -hmm. magazine that normally you and I never heard of other than in news items in the recent past when they were firebombed for a similar offense against uh, some or some perceived offense by some uh, religious wacko. Uh, that was the cartoon where they made fun of the Pope, wasn't it, that, that got him firebombed? Wasn't that the, the cartoon that got him firebombed? The, 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 oh, no, no, excuse me. It was not a Catholic that threw the firebomb at him. It was another Mohammedan for another cartoon that they published making fun of some aspect of that bunch. There are many other situations that they have uh, taken advantage of and made fun of, and et cetera. They, they're, they're equal opportunity satirists, if you will, and they're of somewhat obscene and uh, pornographic uh, nature. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. They can't. France is very big on the yeah. hate speech. Or yeah. As long as the hate speech is directed at, at Jews, then they will, right. they will prosecute it. Okay. So they, they had one cartoon that was making fun of Jews, and the cartoonist got fired and then was uh, held criminally liable. Well, Europe is full of these anti-Semite. In fact, they're rounding up people now in France this week for anti-Semitism, which that's an interesting term because Jews are only 10 percent, maybe, Semite. All Arabs are Semitic people. All native Jews, i.e., those people calling themselves Jews that are Hebrew lineage that are still in the Middle East are Semitic people. Uh, in other words, 90% of the folk calling themselves Jews these days are not Semitic. So it actually was aimed at others, a very small minority of that population. But the bottom line is certain people are protected more than others in Europe. You go to jail. In fact, there were a couple of Americans that went to jail several years ago in Germany. They made the mistake of... Uh, publishing comments or facts that uh, disparaged the Holocaust, the myth of the Holocaust. And uh, while the, the, the entire thing is not a myth, many of the details are mythical. For example, the six million Jews that were allegedly killed. The, uh, in fact, that comment right there would get me thrown in jail in Germany and France and certain other countries in Europe because I disparaged the Holocaust myth, myths. The uh, bottom line is what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Oh, no it's not. 
that that gander happens to be of the different persuasion. There's also some aspects to this thing which are smacking of a false flag. Uh, I've seen the video, and I'll have to show that to y'all when I figure out how to put it on a stick. The video, the unfuzzed video of allegedly the one of the shooters shooting that cop on the on the uh, pavement that you've seen on, let's see, CNN would not show the thing because of the violence that it implied up to the point when the, the, the shooter rushes up and is 10 feet or so from the cop, doesn't point his rifle at the cop, then they, they shift, they, they change it. Well, whereas Fox would show you a still that was unfuzzed of the shooter pointing his rifle at the cop, but what you don't see is that when the shooter leaves the cop, he points his rifle, does not fire. There's no recoil. If he does fire, he was using a paintball gun. Uh, no recoil, and the cop's head, doesn't, there's no effect from a bullet striking him. Uh, there is a smoke puff about 10 feet beyond the cop that you see on the pavement, but there's no evidence of a firing by the bad guys, AK. So what's going on there, folks? Was this another false flag? Well, there is evidence of that. Okay. There's also evidence of a false flag in this latest uh, attack. They claim the attack this week on the uh, computers of the Pentagon and other government agencies attacking their social media pages or something like this. Uh, some people have called anonymous, have tracked it down to, the, to a Maryland IPO address that is suspiciously like the NSA's. So uh, more on that as we get information there. There's some interesting stuff going on behind the scenes that unfortunately with two hours a day or a week, we can't cover all those little details. So do your own studying there, folks. For one thing, you can prove that some of this stuff is wrong. It would be nice if all of it was an error and that Obama was a good guy and a, an American patriot, et cetera, and a, a, uh, an embracer of the Constitution. But it doesn't appear that way. So. See if I can call this up. Uh, there's more on the attacks in Paris, which we might get to later. But I want to start giving you some bread and butter information about jury duty so when you're called up, you'll know what to do. <clears throat> this is page two of the Citizen's Rule Book. This book is to revive, as Jefferson put it, the ancient principles. It's not designed to promote lawlessness or a return to the jungle. The ancient principles refer to the Ten Commandments and the common law. The common law is, in simple terms, just plain common sense and has its roots in the Ten Commandments. In 1776, we came out of bondage with faith, understanding, and courage. Even against great odds and with much, with much bloodshed, we battled our way to achieve liberty. Liberty is that delicate area between the force of government and free will of men. Liberty brings freedom of choice to work, to trade, to go and live wherever one wishes. It leads to abundance. Abundance, if made an end in itself, will result in complacency, which leads to apathy. Apathy is the let George do it philosophy. This always brings dependency. For a period of time, dependents are often not aware they're dependent. They delude themselves by thinking that they're still free. Quote, we never had it so good, unquote. We can still vote, can't we? Eventually, abundance diminishes and dependency becomes known by its true nature, bondage. There are a few ways out of bondage. Bloodshed and war often result, but our founding fathers learned of a better way. 
realizing that a creator is always above and greater than that which he creates. They established a three-vote system by which an informed citizenry can control those acting in the name of government. To be a good master, you must always remember the true pecking order or chain of command in this nation. Number one, God created man. We did not create him. He created us. Number two, man, that's you, created the Constitution. Government did not create the Constitution. Man created it. Number three, Constitution created government. Number four, government created corporations, etc. The base of power was to remain in we the people, but unfortunately it was lost to those leaders acting in the name of government, such as politicians, bureaucrats, judges, lawyers, etc. As a result, America began to function like a democracy instead of a republic. A democracy is dangerous because it is a one-vote system as opposed to a republic, which is a three-vote system. Three votes to check tyranny, not just one. American citizens have not been informed of their other two votes. Our first vote is at the polls on election day when we pick those who are to represent us in government. But what can be done if those elected officials don't perform as promised or expected? Well, the second of the votes, the second two votes, excuse me, the second and third votes are the most effective means by which a common people of any nation or earth have ever had in controlling those appointed to serve them in government. The second vote comes when you serve on a grand jury. Before anyone can be brought to trial for a capital or infamous crime by those acting in the name of government, permission must be obtained for people serving on the grand jury. The Minneapolis Star and Tribune in March 27, 1987, noted a purpose of the grand jury this way, quote, a grand jury's purpose is to protect the public from an overzealous prosecutor, unquote. The third and most powerful vote, this is when you are acting as a jury member during a courtroom trial. At this point, the buck stops with you. It is in this setting that each juror has more power than the President, all of Congress, and all of the judges combined. Congress can legislate, make law, President or some other bureaucrat can make an order or issue regulations, and judges may instruct or make a decision, but no juror can ever be punished for voting not guilty. Any juror can, with impunity, choose to disregard the instructions of any judge or attorney in rendering his vote. If only one juror should vote not guilty for any reason, there's no conviction and no punishment at the end of the trial. Thus, those acting in the name of government must come before the common man to get permission to enforce a law. Now, I'm going to stop here. We'll commit, continue next week. You are above the law in the case of the jury. Remember that. You are above the law as a juror. You decide, to put it in a nutshell, and I'll give you the proof next week. But the jury decides, in case some of you get called before next week. The jury decides not only the facts in the case, i.e., did Joe Schmuck do what he's being accused of doing, or not, but they also decide whether the thing that's so-called illegal that he was accused of doing is moral, ethical, and constitutional. Okay? In other words, they judge the law and the defendant in the trial, both. And of course, the same applies to the grand jury, but the third and most important vote is the one at the actual jury trial. Now, as we mentioned last week, though, many, many of these people 
today are sent to prison without a trial. They plead guilty. They make a deal and plead to some lesser case and so, or some lesser charge. And so they end up getting the punishment with no trial. And be aware of this in the federal system, especially under federal sentencing guidelines set down by Congress. If you're initially charged with five things, five different things, two of which can be completely BS, you might be guilty of three of them, but they do this so that you'll plead down. And what you don't understand is that there's a guy in the marshal's office in the courthouse that all he does all day long is sit in front of a computer and type in the charges that have been filed against uh, criminal X or accused criminal X. Types them in and it comes out with the sentence guidelines for that crime. He does that for all five of them and then compiles what the maximum sentence that this guy can get and what the minimum sentence he can get for those five crimes. Not the three that he's going to plead out. Let's say he pleads to three that he actually did something to. The other, he gets the, whether he pleads guilty to the, the five or not, doesn't matter. He gets the sentence for those five crimes. They did this to the Branch Davidians. If people didn't see that, probably didn't catch that because they didn't stress that. The media didn't dwell on the fact that the Branch Davidians that were found guilty in their trial after the, uh, the, the massacre at Mount Carmel by the federal government, see, there were no federal agents charged with anything. But the Davidians were charged with all kinds of things. And the, tr the, the jury trial found them not guilty of all counts, all the, all the felonies they were charged with, et cetera, including murdering those uh, BATFE agents. They were found not guilty of any of that, but they were found guilty of one charge that was a minor charge. I believe it was even a misdemeanor, some kind of weapons charge. That was the only thing they found them guilty of. And suddenly, at the sentencing stage, they get 30 years because they got found guilty of one. They got the penalty for all of it. Uh, and two of the jurors went public on alternative media, not the national media, not the ABC, NBC, etc. Okay, it was Alex Jones program and another one. They went public and said, we did not know that was going to happen. If we had known, we thought they would get probation because none of them had a criminal record. If we had known, they were going to be slapped with that too, with that lengthy a sentence. They would have found them not guilty of anything. So... That's the travesty in the system today. That's why you need to be aware of what's going on here in the jury trial and what you're supposed to do, your duty. Don't get out of jury duty, folks. That is an obligation of citizenship, one of the few that you have. Voting is not an obligation. That's a privilege given to you by the state of Louisiana. Okay? Of course, the feds have gotten involved in it. The Constitution is very clear. The federal government has no say in voting, who votes. They have no say. That's very plain in here. But it's left up to the states to decide who votes and when the elections are held, other than the national elections, which are specifically stated in the, in the Constitution. But those are the only ones. So if it's not in the Constitution specifically, it is reserved to the states or the people. Remember that. Now, let's see. Make no mistake, life can be unfair. And this is what 
going back to the progressive mentality, they want to make everybody equal, equal, okay? Make no mistake, life can be unfair by Thomas Sowell. Oh, no, I read that one, didn't I? Excuse me. No, 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 sorry about that. Didn't mark it. I read part of that. Um, I keep this and read the whole thing later for you. After you've forgotten it. In the context of the race baiters. Oh, by the way, do you know how Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson make their money? They have these, well, let's see, Sharpton makes even more money than Jackson, unless Jackson is also scamming the taxes and not paying his, he just hasn't been caught at it, or they haven't publicized it. But Al Sharpton's been to the White House, what, 70 times, and he owes the federal the, under the federal statutes, he owes the IRS millions, but he he can go to the White House. He's he's uh, Obama's man on the scene when it comes to racial issues. Money has nothing to do with it. Okay, but they extort, they blackmail companies, they blackmail these big companies. The, the most recent we've heard rumblings about was Sharpton threatened to picket Walmarts if they didn't donate to his uh, whatever group he started, organization, what have you. So what do they do? Well, they're going to donate. They don't want the bad publicity of a bunch of people calling them racist with signs out in front, etc. So, I mean, who can blame them? Well, I blame them. Again, it's the wussification of the country as a whole. When they start that stuff, these companies need to, first of all, arrest them for attempted bribery, okay, or extortion, etc. File charges, criminal charges against these people for attempted extortion. Uh, and then if they start their monkey shines, then they get a court order to stop it because, yeah, court orders can be obtained for certain things if you've got justification. And something like that, yeah, I'll bet you, you'll find a judge these days. Maybe. If not, make a stink in the media anyway. Take out full-page ads if the National uh, Alphabet Soup folks won't publish it. Let's see. Here's another one from Seoul. I know I had something else from Seoul I wanted to pass on to you. Do emotions or facts play the larger role now? And of course, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier about progressives. Progressives and the truth, progressives and reality are far removed. The progressives play on emotion. That is their primary hold card be it racial, uh, be it economic uh, disparity, et cetera. They play on emotion, not on the realities, as we pointed out before. And Seoul has an article dealing with this. Some of us who are old enough to remember the old television police series Dragnet may remember Joe Friday saying, just the facts, ma'am but that would be completely out of place today. Facts are becoming obsolete, as recent events have demonstrated. What matters today is how well you can concoct a story that fits people's preconceptions and arouses their emotions. Politicians like New York Mayor de Blasio, professional demagogues like Al Sharpton, and innumerable irresponsible people in the media have shown that they have great talent in promoting a lynch mob atmosphere towards the police, for example. Well, it's not just the police. It's toward any aspect of society that they have some uh, ax to grind dealing with them. And of course, let me stop here a minute. 
<laughs> and with the media, watch the weather channel sometime. Now, the weather can get pretty boring, saying the same thing every hour over and over again. So these people have to juice it up. They have to get emotional about the weather. They'll be interviewing somebody on a day like today out in the middle of it. It's not that bad out there, but they got to make it make the viewers think it's a lot worse. Uh, excuse me, but how do you get emotional about the weather unless it's a hurricane or some other major storm that does some serious damage? How do you get emotional about the weather? Well, they do it. They do it all the time. Watch them sometimes. That guy, is it Jim Canterry, that muscle built, that, that weightlifter type that they have standing out in the hurricanes all the time? He'll be standing out in a, in a rain squall. It ain't, that, it ain't that bad. And he's in water. The water. It's starting to flood a little bit, and he's in water up to his knees maybe. Of course, he could be standing in a creek for all we know. And boy, does he get emotional about that stuff. Come on, guy. Back to the facts, Jack. Just the facts, ma'am. Grand juries that examine hard facts live in a different world from mobs who listen to rhetoric and politicians who cater to the mobs. During the controversy over the death of Trayvon Martin, for example, a member of the Congressional Black Caucus said that George Zimmerman had tracked Trayvon Martin down and shot him like a dog. The fact is that Zimmerman did not have to track down Trayvon Martin, who was sitting right on top of him, punching him till his face was bloody. After the death of Michael Brown, members of the Congressional Black Caucus stood up in Congress with their hands up saying, don't shoot. Although there were some who claimed that this is what Michael Brown said and did, there were other witnesses, all black, by the way, who said that Brown was charging toward the policeman when he was shot. What was decisive was not what either set of witnesses said, but what the autopsy revealed. And we mentioned that earlier in the other piece. Okay? Witnesses can lie, but the physical facts don't lie, even if politicians, mobs, and the media prefer to take lies seriously. Now, I want to make a comment here about the uh, Michael Brown case and the media which has come back to haunt them in other ways, the same attitude. The lies about the Michael Brown case, i.e. that he had his hands up and his back to the cop when the cop shot him, and the cop shot him in the back and he had his hands up. The lies about that started with some of those initial witnesses, that so-called witnesses that the media interviewed and it stayed with them. It was much more dramatic that that's what happened, of course, in light of the current uh, uh, fervor to start race war in this country. The media was right in there pursuing the lies. Again, most of the media are progressives, and lies are much more e easily passed down if they are in keeping with the progressive agenda. And so those initial reports were what stayed with many of the media clowns throughout much of what happened. And there was the hints of it even after it looked like that was a lie. They would still hint about it. And of course, the hands up, don't shoot stuff, that stayed with the demonstrators and others like Sharpton you know good and well that Sharpton did not tell those people in those crowds that, oh, don't do that anymore because it's not true. Okay? It didn't happen with that case. And, of course, the media clowns were trying to get a jump on everybody else, on, the, on their competition, by interviewing these people that claimed to be on the scene right there and saw it from a mere few feet away that this is what happened in this case. And of course, these people, some of whom are now up on charges of perjury in this case, 
and lying in, in police reports, etc. Okay? So, the media in their quest to get a jump on the competition, and there was a recent case that uh, NBC did, not MSNBC, but the regular NBC nightly news where they apologized. Well, not quite apologized. They simply recanted something that uh, they had reported that was shown very soon afterward that it was not true. And we're talking about a few hours at the most. So it's not a question of, well, the news was a week late getting out. No, it wasn't that at all. If these people would just wait, responsible journalism is out the window, just as responsible politicians or political figures is out the window. So all in the name of being the first on the scene. Now, is this the kind of stuff that we want? Grand juries responding to mobs and the media instead of to the facts. Well, there's some indicators that the grand juries in both of those big cases, those police cases, the grand juries were steered in the direction that they went by the uh, district attor district's attorney, district attorneys, uh, some indicator of that. Nevertheless, the, especially the first case, the one in uh, Missouri, Michael Brown case, that was fairly meticulously examined. Whether it was the grand jury themselves doing that or whether it was the DA, uh, part of that was the DA apparently because word leaked out that the DA wanted, because this was such a politically charged case, he wanted to be sure that uh, this stuff was carefully deliberated upon. So, hey, what can we say? We don't know for sure. One or two of the grand jurors have even uh, filed some sort of legal action to get the uh, records uh, unsealed so that their verdict or their voting on this case could be heard. So we'll see what happens there if any of the other information comes out. But be that as it may, folks, don't be stampeded into anything. It's like we were talking about earlier with the, uh, the this electronic age and all of these little gigaws that people carry in their pockets or all of these these capabilities that that little square thing that's not much bigger than this citizen's rule book uh, has to, to get information or to get other things that people might crave. And of course part of that is, oh, I got to get my Facebook updated right away with what I'm doing immediately. What's just happened to me? It's so important. No, it's not. What's important is your safety to get out of the danger area at the first possible moment, okay? And not to crowd the electronic airways with uh, superfluous BS. That's what happened with the hurricanes. Um, which one was that a, where, it was a, it was something that had happened, it wasn't necessarily a hurricane, where everybody was trying to text at once or on the cell phones at once and, and nobody could get through because of it. But see, that's, that's critical, folks. It's critical for the authorities to know what's going on. It's not critical for you to know what's going on because you can't do anything about it right then except get out of the area, get yourself safe. What do we got? What do we got? What's our timing? 6.20. Okay. Uh, let's see if there's any other, I know there's a lot of stuff going on, it's just a question of what can we cover.
practical tidbit for you from Michael Barron from Friday. His column, Family Fragmentation, What Can Be Done? Well, a lot of it is restrict those electronic devices. Uh, there was a cartoon dealing with that a while back where people had quit talking to each other. And this is true, even within the family. Before all this electronic stuff, there were other things, watching TV or listening to the radio or records or what have you, and, and people had quit communicating with one another. And uh, they're kind of making fun of the fact that now people are communicating again. And they show a picture of two folks sitting at the same table. They're both typing away, texting each other across the same tables. They're, not, they're still not talking, but at least they're communicating, okay? That's one thing. Uh, family gatherings. I had come up with a rule that, of course, nobody went by it. I'm the only one who didn't have a, one of those machines with me talking to some, get a, somebody get a phone call in the middle of it. I came up with a rule that we needed to institute that the first one that uses their cell phone gets to pay for everybody else's meal. I thought that was a good idea myself. <laughs> See, since I would be the only one to never have to pay again. <laughs> but it didn't go over too well. I'm going to still push it every, every chance I get, every family meal like that. But I mean, we still, we're talking. Not everybody's on the machines. It just occasionally somebody would get on it because some, some friend would, uh, acquaintance or, what do they call those things on Facebook or, or what are those other devices that they, they use? What do they call the people that are on it with them? Are they all friends? They call everybody a friend on, mm -hmm. on those other things? I don't know. But you would think that Sunday dinner at that time of the day, you know, from about at least 12 o'clock until 2 or 3, everybody would be busy with their family. They're not, believe me. Family fragmentation, what can be done? Michael Barron. How big a problem is family fragmentation? Immense, says Mitch Perlstein, head of the Minnesota Think Tank Center of the American Experiment. The biggest domestic problem facing this country. And you could probably argue about that, but it's probably correct. There are a lot of factors a lot of problems, domestic problems facing the country. So, but as far as percentage-wise, this is probably the biggest. They interviewed 40 experts of varying ideology across the nation and put their answers in his book, Broken Bonds, What Fag Family Fragmentation Means for America's Future. That's the good news. The bad news is that none of the experts is confident that he has an answer. What is family fragmentation. Well, we don't have time to go through the whole thing, but about 40% of babies born in America are born outside of marriage. That's true of about 30% of non-Hispanic Caucasians, more than 50% of Hispanics, and more than 70% of black people. Go ahead and take this. Go ahead, caller, you on the air. Hey, Mr. Tom, how you doing? Good. Hey, I um I finally um completed a task I've been trying to do. Um I figured out a way on um PC computers. Um I type in a code, um, like computer code into mm -hmm. the terminal and I can see how many times the NSA has been in your computer. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <clears throat> that could come in handy. Yeah, um, I um, I work for a lot of uh, different um, places and like businesses. Some people are um, just um, personal friends and stuff. And I've I've probably checked a um, hundred computers, and 
every single one of them has at least two NSA um, checks inside of there. Well, see, this is what, this is interesting because this is what we have suspected for years, and been told by people, both privately and in the in the media, that the NSA can and does eavesdrop on everything electronic. They're listening to your phone call right now if you're on a cell phone. Yes. And. It's all recorded. It's not necessarily somebody listening personally right then. But if there's some keywords that you or, or something that is in there that they want to check on, the computer will kick it out and tell a human being to monitor that. So I could see that because the, the list of keywords that they're looking for is quite extensive. 